Oh no. Got traffic there. Blaster, just take it up to the departure end of the runway, then a left turn and a left downwind. Cessna over the threshold, coming up on the white dot, Adderby on the white dot, left turn first available. I got a high wind coming up on about a half mile final, clear to land, Adderby on. Traffic on the left face, you're following a Cessna down, low off your left. Square it up just a little bit, and then we're going to get you in. Start your descent, though. Start your descent on the base. Traffic on final, give me follow on base. Base traffic, start turning toward the numbers now. High wing coming up on quarter mile final, take it all the way down to the green. Cessna taxiing on the green, expedite down to the next hard surface. Get me some speed, there you go, 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 go fast. This is going to be good. I got traffic on a mile final. You're following traffic ahead and to your right. High wing coming up on the threshold. Take it all the way down to the green dot. Five Charlie Sierra, two mile final. A mile final. Turn north. Turn north, and we're going to just make you. Uh, we're going to bring you back around. Jet traffic's coming up on about a mile and a half final runway. Niner clear to land. Okay. All right. Let's 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 listen up, guys. If you're on final for runway nine, I want you to offset to the left. I got a jet that's landing on runway nine. The jet's clear to land runway nine. If you can make it. If not. Just continue straight ahead. It looks like you're going around for the jet. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Oh, we had one right in front of us, sir. Dragger. Let's see. What we got a tricycle. Tricycle. Put it down. Tricycle. Put it down. Tricycle. Put it down. Tail dragger. Down to the green. Uh, green dot. Then a left turn. Short final here. You click land on nine. All the way to the white dot. Go down to the white dot. Find somebody to follow out here. Canard, just come to the runway, and I might have to just send you around. That'll be fine. And for the jet, you just want to stay in this pattern, or you want to go back out for an instrument approach? Stay in a pattern, Charlie. Sierra. All right, just stay with me here for a minute. And my tail dragger, and eh, let's see, over the numbers, go down to the green. Come on. And Canard's going to have to go around. Canard, go around. Canard, go around. Canard, right. go around. And my uh, high wing here over the runway, keep it airborne. Keep it airborne. You do not descend. Do not descend. you got a fast guy behind you. Do not descend. My yeah, Here you go. Keep it airborne. Keep it airborne. As soon as the guy behind you gets uh, slowed down, I'm going to put you down. So keep it airborne. The uh, one that just passed the white dot, make a left turn on the hard surface. All right, my uh, high wing tail dragger, you can put it down now. You can put it down now. And Charlie Sierra, let me get you about a mile off. Let's see, Charlie Sierra, I lost. There you are. Make a left hand turn. I'll try to resequence you here on the down ones. We'll see how it looks. Short final, you're clear to land runway nine on the white dot. Clear to land on the white dot. There you go. And the tricycle left on the hard surface and follow the Fikeman. Welcome. Uh, thanks for being part of the show. And let's see, just find somebody to follow out the, uh, follow on the final, and as you get close to the runway, if it's not going to work, we're going to send you around and then try to re-sequence you. Now, who else got sent around that's not back on the downwind? The Canard? Yeah, Canard. All right, Canard, there's a golf stream up there that went around, too. I just lost sight of him, but you're going to make kind of a left-hand turn and stay low. I think Charlie's here once we're out, dude. 3,200. Okay, that'll be fine. Just maintain VFR. I don't know what else is up there above you. Probably most everybody's down here. So just make a left-hand turn. We'll try to get, uh, try to get you back here. Uh, Canard's got the uh, jet inside. Okay, the RV, maybe an RV-10, whatever, here on final. Keep your speed up and go all the way down to the... Uh, aim for the green dot for me. Uh, actually, keep your speed up. There's a guy behind you. Aim for the green dot, and I'm sure that's plenty of room for you to land on runway 9. You're supposed to land on runway 9. Number two... You're going to go down to the white dot. Follow the white dot. Actually, you know what? That's 1,500 feet. You're going to land at the white dot. The uh, spacing looks adequate here. Two guys on final. You're kind of tight there. Keep each other in sight, and you're going to uh, aim for the white dot. If it's not going to work, we'll do. Uh, we'll come up with a plan B. We might have to send you around. The second guy behind you yeah, out there in about a two-mile final. Are you slow enough to be able to follow that guy in front of you? You need to go around. Well, I probably shouldn't ask that because I had about five guys to answer me, so I should know better than that after 35 years, you would think, right? All right, so uh, let me see. The guy who's number one, it's number one. What kind of airplane is he? An RV type. All right, RV type. Keep it airborne for me. Keep it airborne. And I got a fast guy behind you. The number two guy over the uh, uh, trees there. Go ahead and put it down on the numbers. Put it down on the numbers. My first guy just coming up on the numbers at the, uh, over the grass at the numbers. T minus one minute and counting. Hello. Four, three, two, one. 
Hello, Hello everybody. <laughs> um, welcome along to the live stream. Johnny, you're muted, I noted. <laughs> How is everyone? Yep, very good. Yeah, good, if you can hear me. Yeah, now we can hear you. That's all good. <laughs> well, th <laughs> thanks for joining us. Obviously, um, we haven't got Ian with us. Uh, he's still away on holiday, but filling in for Ian, we have Carol Desola Atkin uh, wearing her fly. Oh, what, what have we got? Oh, that's yeah uh, Blimey, it's like lanyards old and new you've got like the historic lanyard collection there <laughs> and a poolies tag <laughs> very good um but well, uh, good to see everyone uh we've got all the usual stuff uh, as well as tonight's guest guy bowen um who's chairman of flying scholarships for disabled people and he's waiting patiently in the green room we'll have simon shortly with the weather um, uh, but first, we have um, tonight's uh, Sky Demon Top Tip. Um, it's uh, the UK's most popular flight planning app. If you're one of the rare people who's not yet tried it, why not give it a go? It's a 30-day free trial. Uh, tonight's Top Tip is brought to you by um, the famous Tim. So um, run the video. Hi, I'm Tim from Sky Demon. Welcome to today's Top Tip. If you have an airfield you fly to quite often, or you're just quite interested in, you can add it as a permanent favourite in the Airfields tab. To do this, press Add Favourite down here, type in the name, select it, and you'll see it always down here under Favourites, even if you've got another route planned far away. The airfield is always there, so you can quickly see its weather, or go into it, see current NOTAMs, or access its plates. To remove it as a favourite, press the pin button and go unpin from favourites and we can see it's disappeared again. For more information on any of our features, go to skydemon.aero and choose help and support. It's another tip that I didn't know. <laughs> I've got to say, it's, it's always the Sky Demon user interface. It's like it's like so simple. It's like Tim's like, yeah, just pin it, unpin it. Yeah. It's like one of the reasons why that software is so good. If you don't use it, you must give it a try because mm. it does revolu revolutionize your flying. So. Does anybody else think it's unusual that Tim's favorite airfield was Ostend? I, I, I wasn't even <laughs> going to remark on that. So, you know, Tim just loves Belgium. So. <laughs> It's like sec secrets of the Sky Demon team. So um, mm. anyway, it must be time to um, roll in some Simon, I think, isn't it? Let's bring him in. Bring him in. Simon, roll hello. In. <laughs> <laughs> how are we all? Very Good well. How are you? you? Yeah, we're great. Have you been flying? Good. No, let's not talk about it. Ed. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> let's move. Look, the novel, right, when I finish this, is going to be like that thick. It'll be the best seller on amazon <laughs> they, genuinely when they make the film and tom cruise plays you the yep. the the film trailer will be able to use the line the epic story of simon learning to fly <laughs> they, will. they will they will it'll be a good one though it'll be good uh tom can be my body double of course of course so, <laughs> you know, naturally What's <laughs> so the weather like? It's something for everybody to look forward to. Uh, right, should we do a bit of weather? Should we get yeah. crack on with the weather? This is uh, how things look for Friday. Actually, it's going to be quite a good weekend. High pressure's building in, and um, it looks as if, apart from being a little bit breezy, for most of us, there's going to be some decent flying conditions around. Uh, and for me, that really pains me to say that. <laughs> so I'm going to be looking out there wishing I was up there. But anyway, that's a different story. So this is uh, how things shape up for tomorrow. Can you see this weak front? When you, when you see a front like this on the charts, it's got breaks in it, or sometimes it has little plus signs in between. That means that the front is weakening. And we've got one of these tomorrow. Just moves its way south. It's a cold front. There's not much on it apart from just a little area area of cloud it brings bases down to about 2,000 feet tops on that will be at about 8,000 feet could be one or two up at about 10,000 feet and they would be just enough to produce one or two spots of rain now once that front is cleared southwards and it's weakening all the time as it does go south we'll get some higher bases following in behind probably about 4,000 foot bases six seven thousand foot tops and good visibility coming in as well
well. It's a northerly flow, so it's relatively unstable, and it may just be able to produce a shower or two, but generally it looks like being a decent day on Friday once that front has cleared. I should say, just across southern England, it's fairly cloudy. There may be an odd shower, but actually, even across southern England, it looks like it's pretty decent flying. Now, for Saturday, high pressure to the northwest of Scotland. Quite a bit of cloud around on Saturday. You see here the cloud ceiling forecast, generally showing green colours, but because there's so much colour on there, that indicates there's probably quite a bit of cloud. Typical bases, two to 3,000 feet, tops at about five to 6,000 feet. Maybe an odd shower just down the east eastern coast, but for most of us, it's dry. Visibility is going to be pretty good as well. We're still at sort of 20 to 30 kilometres uh, viz for most of us. Just a bit of a northerly breeze picking up, particularly for England and Wales. Could be looking there at speeds um, probably around about 15 to 18 knots. Um, so it just picks up a touch. Could be gusts of 20 to 25 knots along eastern coast. And then for Sunday, the high drifts into Scotland on Sunday. Still plenty of dry weather around. Still a fair amount of clouds. You see here the cloud ceiling forecast. They're generally green again. So Probably bases of around two and a half to three and a half thousand feet on Sunday. Tops at about seven thousand feet. And I think, again, may just be an odd shower in the east. But generally, for most of us, it looks pretty fair. I think uh, breezes on Sunday northeastly at about sort of 12 to 15 knots. So not much wind around. And again, as I say, those visibilities look pretty good. So all in all, quite a decent flying weekend. I should just say, those of you thinking across channel actually on Sunday, that northeast flow may just bring some showers into Kent, into the eastern sides of, in eastern areas of Sussex and Surrey, and just lying through the channel as well. So check the forecast carefully if you're thinking about anything cross channel on Sunday. I wouldn't be surprised if some of those clouds turn out to be quite deep um, mid channel. So uh, do just check before you fly. Uh, obviously, take a look at uh, Form 215 to get the update on that. Um, so have a fantastic flying weekend is basically the message. Now, don't forget, I've got an aviation weather school. Um, this is going to be a mid week aviation weather school part one. It's classroom based. It's based here at Weather School HQ. And it's going to be between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. on Wednesday, the 22nd of March. I think we've got two places is remaining on that so if you want to come, come along but well, don't do these midweek courses very often this is your chance go to weatherschool.co.uk and book your place now have a wonderful weekend guys and uh, i'll see you next week fantastic simon thank you very much we've got johnny back just in time did you find yeah can you do that again simon i missed it <laughs> <laughs> of course I can, Johnny. here we go <gasps> yeah, you'll have to watch on catch up yeah yeah it'll all have changed by then Great yep. stuff. Thanks, Simon. See you Cheers, soon. Simon. See you, Simon. Brilliant. Well, that was timely, Johnny, because you can you're back in time to give us the pro, the Flyer Club promo. Yeah. So if you're not a member, then you can join for five pounds a month, uh, or fifty two quid for the full year. And for that, you get all sorts of stuff, all the content we produce, free landing vouchers every month. Which this month you've got just under a week to use them. We've, we've got Eshot, Middle Zoy. Hombeck Farm, Fishburn, Fenland, and a cheaper fee at Blackpool, or completely free if you take 50 litres of fuel. Um, and also, we've got a load of webinars planned throughout the year. We had one a couple of nights ago with Darren Lewington, all about air traffic control and how not to piss, annoy them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, join. Five quid a month. It's, it's an absolute bargain for the you know, price of a couple of cups of coffee. Some of the best value in aviation in the UK. Yeah, mm. definitely. Well, I reckon that takes us nicely into the news. So, um, Dave. Yep. So our top story this week is about Swansea Airport again. <laughs> Last week, we reported that uh, Swansea Airport has had its license suspended by the CAA. Since then, uh, we've learned that the airport has been, to put it bluntly, neglected for a few years, quite many years, with key infrastructure, not just not working, but actually removed from the site. Um, there's things like the perimeter uh, needs fencing to keep out wild, wildlife, and there's several miles of it. Uh, the cafe's been closed for seven years, and that's in addition to all the issues that the CAA found. Um, apparently, the CAA made uh, an unannounced spot check on the airport and found a whole bunch of things going wrong, no safety management system, all sorts of you know things that uh, they didn't have an accountable manager. Uh, these are all things that are, a license revolves around for for an airport anyway we've spoken to a chap called bob oliver 
who is chairman of the Swansea Airport Stakeholders Alliance. That's been formed because they could see that the airport was in trouble, the infrastructure was disappearing. Um, Bob explained some of the issues to us, and it's in a video which is uh, available on our YouTube channel. Um, he also showed us a master plan which the Alliance members have come up, come, come up with to put things right. Their big worry is that Swansea Council, which owns the airport, might just say, it's all too much trouble, and we're going to close it. Um, and that's why the Alliance has come up with what they call their first 100 days emergency action plan, should the council ask them to step in and take over from the existing operator. Uh, and that's what most people would appear to want. It's going to come to a head at the end of February, because that's when the CA has set a deadline for things to happen. They're not really necessarily expecting all the things to be done by the end of February, but there needs to be a plan in place to do them. Um, they've said this to the operator before, and it hasn't happened. So they're a bit more suspicious this time. Uh, they're going to need convincing to, if not revoke the license, at least keep suspension going for a while. So anyway, it's, it's in abeyance. We should know what's going to happen at the end of February, uh, beginning of March. Uh, and that's not very far away. It's quite a tough mm. task, isn't it, when you think about it, to keep an airfield in a licensed situation. Like you say, you know, just to keep it fenced and secure, it's, yep. it's actually miles of fencing. So. Yep. And apparently the lease that the operator has with the council, uh, which has just come up for renewal, it revolves around maintaining the, maintaining the licence. Mm. It revolves around having a cafe, which has been closed for seven years, yeah. They need to have uh, to keep that license. They need to have the fire, uh, the, you know, the fire side of it covered. Um, there's a whole bunch of things which have to happen. Um, so it doesn't. It looks a bit messy at the moment. Mm. Fingers crossed, it will turn out okay. Jane mm. Gifford said, "I watched Dave chatting with Bob. It was very interesting. So if you haven't mm. seen the video, check. Like Dave said, uh, go and find it on YouTube. Mm. Yep, very good." Um, I've got some news. Um, the LAA has a new CEO. Um, not quite yet. He's uh, he's about to transition um, uh, in the role with Steve Slater, the outgoing um, CEO. Uh, but it's a chap called Simon Tilling. He's been appointed and uh, he'll take over in mid-April um, and uh, brings a wealth of leadership and general management customer service experience uh, together with a passion for sport and recreational aviation. Um, Simon apparently said, this is my dream role and I can't wait to get started, which, which is great news. Mm -hmm. uh, he's an experienced pilot. He's owned various LAA types, including one of the UK's oldest Taylor Craft Auster aircraft. Um, he's also British air racing champion and um, a former British air racing champion uh, from 2022 to 20, 2020 to 2022. He was the chairman of the Royal Aero Club 3Rs. Um, and during that time, he regenerated the appeal of air racing to new participants. Uh, Errol Smith, chairman of the LAA, said, I'm delighted to announce Simon's appointment as CEO and look forward to working with him in the future uh, to further improvement to our performance and standing of, and standing of the association on behalf of our members. Because the, you know, the LAA is a members association, first and foremost, mm -hmm. all about providing service to the members. So um, that will be great. Mm -hmm. uh, Simon, congratulations and welcome aboard. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Do, you keep, do you keep your job as the LAA when this happens, Ed? I, there's, there's no guarantees. There are no, I've always worked on the basis there's no guarantees in life, are there, Dave? It could, no. it could all change from one day to the next. Uh, no, as I know, it's happened several times. That's it. <laughs> yeah. I know it's a, if I didn't have the magazine to edit, I could do a lot more flying. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Good. Right. right. We're on to the next one, aren't we? So this is, if it's people remember one. the Airlander, which speeder. kind of went, went out of control a bit. Airspeeder. Uh, Airspeeder, sorry. Air, not Airlander, that's something completely different. Airspeeder, which is the drone yeah. that went a bit haywire out of Goodwood in 2019 and ended up in in a Gatwick hold. Um, <laughs> it's, it's come on a bit since then, and it now looks like this. This is the Airspeeder Mark IV, built by... A louder aeronautics and it's now a very fast crude or manned crude flying car uh, built in south australia in adelaide um, this is claimed to reach top speed of 225 miles an hour in 30 seconds and it's built for racing um the, the ceo of the company says basically we've, we've built vehicles developed the sport 
secured the venues, attracted sponsors and technical par partners. Um, and they're saying it's going to battle it out in blade to blade racing, which just sounds absolutely terrifying. <laughs> well, that's, that's clearly a, just, just, just a big lie, really, isn't it? Because if you put the photo back up, it's not blade to blade. They put they put namby pamby little blade shrouds on it. You know, if it was blade to blade racing, it could be a bit like Roman chariots. You think mm. they would have left those off? Um, what I want to know is, have they called this one the infringer? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. But it's got a ma maximum takeoff weight of nine hundred and fifty kilos. That's quite I mean, heavy. That's yeah, an almost two hundred mile range. Uh, okay, we'll we'll Apparently. maybe I guess, maybe I'm getting a lot of that weight every batteries. It's pretty, yeah. it's pretty exciting looking. Um, yeah. Yes, and, uh, yeah. Sky um, Skycrow Bob Crow says, "Reminds me, I need to buy a new Dyson." <laughs> <laughs> Dyson fan. So um, yeah, but um, I I know they've been really pushing for this um, uh, mm. for this race series. Uh, maybe mm. this this is where it's all going to come right for them. Yeah. Well, over the last few years, since that incident at Goodwood, they have run uh, unpiloted, uh, you know, drone racing, um, yeah. and that's been you know, been getting better and better and more. They, they've learned how to make uh, make the things work and reliably now, unlike uh, the first one. And, mm. uh, I was looking at that photo, going, "It's a bit. It reminds me a bit of Jerry Anderson and uh, yeah, Dave White. Yeah. It's the Angel Interceptor from Captain Ooh. Scarlet. Totally yeah. true." <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if we'll see it at the Festival of Speed at Goodwood in the future. I, I, think I would imagine they're probably banned from Goodwood, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think the CEA will take some take, take some persuading as well. That's it. Oh, yeah. Paul yeah. Wheel reminds us the mm. the Airlander was was referred to as the flying butter. I imagine if 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 Lau, if a Luda Air Sport got hold of the Airlander, that would be a whole mass of chaos, wouldn't it? If they unleashed that <laughs> gap in airspace. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, would I would imagine you might not be seeing that at a UK public event anytime soon. Mm. Yeah. General aviation, anyone? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. General. Deliveries are up in here. Sorry. Deliveries are up. Oh yes, indeed. But what a better way to measure the health of general aviation than by the number of deliveries that are going on? And the deliveries are up. Uh, before nice table. Before I go any further, here's a little quiz. Can you guess how many Cessna 172s were delivered last year? They're the best, still the top selling Cessna. So see if you can guess and I'll tell you at the end. Anyway, there's uh, an organization called the General Aviation Manufacturers Association, also known as GAMMA. See, we're, we're not doing our three letter acronyms today, are we? We've, we've been through it. <laughs> there's no fault. Yeah. <laughs> and compared to 2021, there's been an increase of 6%, and in real terms, that is $26.8 billion. Um, the best-selling, uh, oh, well, the Cirrus SR22T continues to be the best-selling piston. They've had 280 delivered uh, last year, and uh, Cirrus made a total of 629 aircraft in 2022, and that included 90 vision jets. That's so impressive. That's that's impressive. This, yeah. This is not a conversation for people who are struggling to pay their heating, is it? Really? No. <laughs> Somebody's paying for this stuff. Uh, and Gulfstream. Gulfstream. Uh, they're um been selling 120 private jets for a total of 6.6 .6 billion US dollars. So oh. that's all in perspective. I don't know yeah. if you want to uh, oh we've got some guesses on the uh, the one seven two. We've got, se we've got seven, 323, 280, mm -hmm. um, 250, 15, 78, 122, 172. That would be brilliant well, if it was. This tells you who's been reading the articles, doesn't it? Because it's all online. 99. <laughs> who's, who's closest? I think, uh, let, me, let me scroll through. It might be Jane, actually. Uh, what we, be Jane? Hold on, let's have a look. Uh, Jane, the answer is 172. The answer is 151. 151. So it's probably yeah. it's, it's a it's a it's a draw. Annabelle and Jane. Well done. Yes. Well done, you. Shall I reel off some statistics about uh, deliveries? Mm. Hit us with. Like, like, 
Okay. Oh, right, you've got them all there. Okay, well, let me tell you the, the highlighted bits. The uh, piston aeroplane deliveries had an increase of 8.2% with 1,524 units. Tobo props up 10.4%, 582 units. Business jets increased. Uh, they're pretty much the same as last year, 712 compared to 710. Um, the value of aeroplane deliveries was 22.9 billion, which is an increase of 5.8%. Helicopter deliveries up 7.2%, 194 units. And preliminary commercial turbine helicopter increase, I'm sure you're all interested in that, up 7.6%, which is 682 units. And preliminary value of helicopter deliveries, don't you just love statistics? 4.4 4 billion, which is an increase of approximately 6.8%. So it's all healthy. So I don't think it's gone down. Sure. It's following two years of the, the whole COVID. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, know, what's it, you know, it'd be more interesting to compare it to, you know, um, 2019, really. Yeah. But, but still, it's, it's the right direction. Yeah. That's, that's the important thing. They are good numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to say, looking back in the comments, we have the new LAA CEO in the um, in the chat. Thanks. Hello, Simon. <laughs> Watching. Thank you, Simon. Thanks for coming along. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Who's next? Right, Dave. It is a story about uh, Bell. What used to be called Bell Helicopters. They're now called Bell Flight. But Bell have flown uh, their single engine 505, which is the the smallest one in their range. They've flown it uh, burning 100% sustainable aviation fuel. That's uh, it's the first time a single engine helicopter has flown using this fuel. Uh, and the reason they, they've been able to do this at 100% sustainable aviation fuel is because they now cracked a way of adding aromatics to the fuel um, so that uh, it performs like a normal jet fuel. The objective is to make a fuel that just a straight drop in. Anyway, so it's made its first flight. Um, and it, uh, it had to work in depth with all the various suppliers to, uh, to this, which is Safran, who supplied the engine, Neste, which supplies the fuel, uh, GKN, and a company called Vlurens, uh, which actually makes the sustainable aviation fuel. And if you're wondering what sustainable aviation fuel is, it's uh, partly made out of waste materials such as cooking fat, but they don't, there's not enough of that around to make the billions of litres that they need. So uh, they also grow various oil-rich products um, to go into that whole whole mix. So it's a biofuel, really. It's the same thing as a biofuel. The industry is placing great in interest in this because um, it's it's really the only way they can make road inroads into the objectives of you know producing less carbon um, is is by using sustainable aviation fuel. Things like electric aircraft and hydrogen aircraft are a long way off. Um, this they can start doing in the next couple of years. I do I do wonder about the whole sustainability, you know, if we have to grow a whole bunch of crops to generate mm. a whole bunch of materials to turn into fuel, doesn't that generate a lot of, that, that, that consumes a lot of carbon, outputs a lot of carbon? So, Well, that, but actually growing the crops absorbs that carbon. This, this is the way the, the, the virtuous circle is. The growing mm. the crops absorbs the carbon, and th therefore when you come to burn the, the fuel, um, and put carbon back into the atmosphere. It's, so it's a kind of virtuous circle. That's what they're trading on. And hope, hopefully in the short term, you don't need a tractor at all. You don't need any machinery to, to grow the crop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, me next. Right. So um, uh, flying scholarships for disabled people news. Um, so the charity has uh, launched its 40th anniversary year on uh, what would have been the birthday of World War II flying ace uh, group captain, uh, Sir Douglas Bader. Uh, the charity set up in 1983 as a living memorial to Bader's indomitable spirit by the late Paul Bowen and Tim Prince, um, who were founders of the Royal International Air Tattoo. Um, Sir Douglas has been a patron and longtime supporter of, the, of that world-renowned air show, uh, and obviously famously lost his legs uh, in a in an accident with the RAF, uh, but went on to achieve fame in World War II as a fighter pilot, leader, and dedicated supporter of disabled people. Um, his his love of flying has been the, ins the inspiration behind the charity, um, which has obviously been going for 40 years, enabling over 500 disabled adults across the UK to change their lives. 
Um, good news is we'll have Guy Bowen on, the chairman of FSDP, shortly to tell us about what's going on in the anniversary year. So that's mm. going to be great. Okay, me? Yep. Go for it, Carol. Vista Aerodrome. If you haven't been go, it's a beautiful airfield. And the best time to go is when there's an event on. It's run by an organisation called Vista Heritage, and they're deeply passionate about vintage aircraft and vintage cars in particular. Uh, they're, br they're bringing back their flagship flywheel event, which is a mixture of cars and aeroplanes. Can't recommend it enough. Get your diaries out. It's on the 17th and 18th of June this year. And uh, so there'll be two years of celebrating Wings Wheels Motion Spectacular Tribute to the former World War II RAF bomber base. It's their 10th year anniversary. So there's a total of 20,000 tickets that are going to be released for the two-day event. It's £27 for adults. And if you're 15 or under, only £7.50. So bring the kids along. It's very family friendly, but it's not family nuisance, if that makes sense. Do we, yeah. is obviously, uh, Bista being a, a very active mm. airfield, do we know if you can fly in for Flywheel? Oh, I'm sure you, I have done in the past. Um, whether that's by invitation only or not, I don't know. Uh -huh. um, Having met some of the organizers, the new organizers there quite recently, they are very aviation friendly. So, it's, um, yeah. Certainly, everything that's gone on at Vista, I mean, it's just a magnificent development at the airfield, isn't it? I know, mm -hmm. you know people got a little bit bent out of shape about the fact they took the what used to be an all direction grass circle and put mm -hmm. on it, but you know, it's so easy to lose an airfield to see one being conserved is fantastic, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It was interesting. We had um, a moth event there recently, and they've got the set runways. And they found that one runway, the mm -hmm. southwesterly runway, ended up going over the people. It was only a small event, so it didn't matter. But the southwesterly one went over the, the runway, and then they found that some of the pilots weren't that well behaved and started flying over this the village, which uh, they don't want you doing that. That's the yeah. place to avoid if you want to keep the airfield. Keep yeah. you, there's plenty of between the airfield and the village so it's not difficult but uh it just means a, a teeny bit of discipline otherwise it's a great nice long runways there nice and smooth very happy there and massively wide as well so oh, nice. it's quite good for moth formation takeoffs when you can all sit across the width so, <laughs> yeah simply, no. uh, simply plain bike guy says yes you can fly in so that's yeah. uh, that is good Ah, but is that for the event? Well, I, we can fly in on a normal day. I think sometimes there are restrictions on event days. You have hmm. to get. Okay. I, I don't know. Uh, check it out. Um, Paul Fraser Benison says, I identify as under 15. So. <laughs> Good stuff. Right, final. A uh, quick news story. Uh, we mentioned the Flyer Club webinars earlier. We had Darren Lewington on on Tuesday. Uh, we've got more planned for the year. The next one's going to be at some point in March. Will Flood is going to be giving an insight into buying and selling aircraft. And then in April, Greeners will be on to discuss UPRT. And the full list is on the Flyer website. There's a news story on there. So if you want to read through and look at what's coming up for the year, you can do that. So I think that's all the news over, isn't it? So I'm going to bring in Guy. Fantastic. Hi, everyone. Good, good evening, you. Guy. How are you doing? Yeah, really good. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome. I'm just trying to work out how to make you bigger. There we go. Oh, don't do that. No, don't make me bigger. Just <laughs> <laughs> me clicking at the same time, Johnny. That's all right. <laughs> good. Well, thanks for joining us. Just give us a bit of a background as to who you are. You're Chair of Flying Scholarships for Disabled People. Um, but t talk us through how you got to that position. Um, pure nepotism, Johnny, as you know, it's just pure nepotism. It's just the son of the founder, so that that kind of helps. No, um, I, uh, my, me personally, I'm a, a pilot myself. I'm an airline pilot with uh, B, BA on the 787. Um, but I've been really fortunate to have grown up on the International Air to Two, or now the Royal International Air to Two, as it's called. Um, and by growing up on that, I grew up alongside the charity that you talked about today, Flying Scholarships for Disabled People. Um, so I guess it's kind of been in my DNA and in my blood. Um, and in a moment of madness, about seven, eight years ago, they invited me along as a trustee. Um, 
Uh, my father unfortunately passed away uh, about 16 years ago, unbelievably now. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been a trustee for four years and then now chairman for three. Uh, so, uh, and the, the charity goes from strength to strength and here we are at our 40th anniversary. Yeah, so just talk us through um, what FSDP does and how it helps people. So uh, it's probably best if I start at the beginning, really. Uh, you mentioned Sir Douglas Bader, um, and yesterday was, or the 21st, was his uh, uh, anniversary uh, of, of his, de of his death. Um, Sir Douglas met my father and Tim Prince in the 70s. And I think there were two quite young reprobates who had an idea to start an air show, which is now the air to two. Um, but the magic dust, the kind of sparkle behind it was Sir Douglas Bader. I think he liked their spirit and with his network at the time uh, was a bit of a fairy godfather. And the relationship I know from my father with him was pretty special. Um, I mean, there are pictures of me as a child with Sir Douglas Bader at the breakfast table, as, and I had no idea of, of who he was. And thinking you look at it now and you go, God, the questions I could have asked. Um, he sadly died in 1983 uh, on his way to do a speech in London and caught everyone by surprise. And he really was a celebrity of his time. Uh, someone described him to me pretty much like a David Beckham of his time. The movies were made of him and, and the stories from the Second World War. And uh, Dad and Tim got together and thought of a way to memorialize this. And in their typical kind of let's go for it, they thought they'd try and teach two disabled people to fly in memory of Sir Douglas. And at the time, I think it was probably only, it wasn't the beginning of a let's start a charity. It was let's do this as a one-off. Um, I think the CAA had kittens when they told them that this is what they wanted to do. But there was enough support and momentum behind the idea. It took off. Um, it happened. Uh, the support came in, the money flew in, the sponsors came in, and here we are now, 40 years later. And in that time, the charity itself has evolved uh, from, uh, in the early days, we gave our scholars a full scholarship. So they walked away with a PPL and off they went. Now, it's very different. We, we aim to try and touch more people. And what we saw, I mean, the cost of flying, as you all know, is quite prohibitive. Um, what we saw is, and, and most of your pilots watching and, and people in, in aviation watching will know that those first few hours in an aeroplane can have an incredible effect on you. Um, and with our scholars, and we, we try and teach anywhere between 10 to 15 a year, um, we give them now 16 hours, uh, and it's very much designed as a catalyst. Uh, they go through exactly what an able-bodied uh, person would do. Uh, with their flying they start right at principles of flight they do their exams they go through straight and level climbing descending and some go all the way to going solo but the main thing we're trying to achieve now is to show them what they're capable of so at the end of those 16 hours uh, we see a different person to the one that we meet at, at Cranwell um, and some carry on um, we're desperately looking for funding to try and for some of them that really you know swallow the pill and want to go the whole way. But for others, that 16 hours was enough to show them, their family, their friends, what they are truly capable of uh, and, and another sense of independence. So they, they kind of move forward. So I think I'd probably start from the beginning and end of the end, but that's that's what we do. Yeah. So how, how are you going to celebrate the 40th anniversary? You've got some things planned for the year, haven't you? Yeah, we do. We do. We couldn't let it go idly by. Um, uh, we're, it's, a, it's another year for us. So we've literally only a few weeks ago done our pre-selection for this year's scholars. So the, the kind of remit of the charity carries on. But alongside that, um, as you mentioned earlier, we've, we've touched about over almost 500 people in the 40 years. Um, and the idea is, and you wouldn't believe it, it the, there is still a perception, I think, within aviation that uh, it is restricted and and with our medicals and what we have to go through as pilots it's something disabled people it's just not accessible to them so our first big event for this year will be in june and we're calling it the big wing tour and our spawn our scholars will be flying the length and breadth of the united kingdom in a various number of aircraft supported uh as well by the air force by the royal air force and and the the red arrows and all of our other sponsors 
and they'll be flying to 40 airfields around the UK from the Orkney Islands all the way down to the south. And the, the main reason for this, if, if I'm honest, isn't fundraising. It's to raise the profile of what disabled people can do in aviation. And by flying into these airfields all around the UK, uh, we want people's jaws to drop as they get out the aircraft, make their way across to the flying club and tell their stories and tell them what we do. And the main aim is to let people know that this is accessible and hopefully that you know, disabled people around the UK will apply for a scholarship next year and hopefully we can help them. Yeah. So that's the first event. Uh, the second one, we can't really get by without celebrating at the Air to Two. So we're going to go all guns at the Air to Two. And I'm uh, a little bit in my father's shadow, but I'm trying to put as many strings as I can uh, to maybe get, and I can't really say anything at the moment, but to try and get something going on in the sky as well as on the ground and linking uh, Barda and his hurricane all the way through to some of our sponsors uh, and uh, hopefully bring in uh, the Jordanians. Uh, back in the 80s, King Hussein of Jordan, who was a friend of the Air to discovered the charity. And ever since, we've had a long lasting link with the Jordanian royal family. So the Jordanians always bring a Hercules to the air show and the, and the Jordanian falcons. So I'm hoping we might be able to do, hint, hint, something with them. But, um, uh, and then finally in September, we're going to be holding a big gala ball to celebrate uh, our birthday. And uh, there'll be an auction with um, some pretty spectacular prizes. Uh, and again, I'm sworn to secrecy, uh, but the details will shortly be coming out. Um, but if I'm honest with you, um, the big reason to celebrate this 40th is to get the message out there. And hopefully your, your, the people watching this will spread the word as well that flying is not limited just to able-bodied people. And we, um, we have met uh, all sorts of disabilities, both visible and not visible, uh, uh, that people would never expect them to get airborne, and they have done. And we've met some incredible people in the years. So hopefully that will happen from these 40th birthday celebrations. Yeah. <clears throat> um, just looking through comments. In the Sorry, comments, no. there are a couple. Uh, Martin Loosby said, in terms of the the the, the <coughs> your grand tour, is are those details going to be available? Because I think there's people saying, yeah, we'd love to. That would be great to go and you know fly along and and fly and and be in locations where people can be greeted. So they absolutely will be available, and I and it, this is also a kind of a shout out to the kind of general aviation community to please go and meet our scholars as they arrive. Um, if it's okay with you guys, I, I, we, to be fair, you should, we should have them on the screen right now. But if we share them with you at a later date, and perhaps on your, another show, you can you can put the route up and, and put yeah. the dates up. Yeah, definitely. Um, and please do go and meet them as they arrive at these airfields, and and it'll help you. They are the true magic of our of our charity. Listening to boring old me doesn't put it into perspective um, of the journey that these people have gone through, and. Um, the scholarship doesn't end, by the way, when they finish their flying. We very much are a community, a family. We keep them involved. Um, some of them go on to become mentors to future scholars coming through. And it really is worth stressing that when they start this scholarship, they are the people that we meet. Are They come from all different ages, um, backgrounds, but they are in a really low point in life, lacking self-confidence, the inspiration to kind of move forward in life. And the change is remarkable when you get them in an air, in an aircraft and the instructor pulls their hands back and goes crack on um it, it it's it is life changing so um, as you can see from that picture that the picture you've got on screen now um i actually took without him knowing so apologies Stephen, if he's watching this um Stephen was a paralympian who um came to us at the end of his swimming career uh, and i think it was a bit kind of um lost as to what what was going forward because his, his life had been around swimming um and he did his scholarship at staverton um with bristol aero club and this was him flying in to visit um me and my family for a cup of tea at kemble and we were all sat outside on the decking at kemble uh with a load of people and he parked up got out and walked out from the aircraft and it was like a cowboy film like i said earlier it went silent and it was magic because straight away 
uh, 30, 40 people had their perceptions and what aviation is blown out the water. And this was him walking back to fly back to uh, Gloucester. So it, it's, an, it's incredible. And it's exactly what Douglas Bader was uh, and why he, we, he's still a legend today. Because back in the, in the pre-war and the pre-Second World War, a man who lost his legs, he couldn't be a Spitfire pilot, a Hurricane pilot in the Battle of Britain. There's no way. And he went on to become an ace and, and obviously lead his big wing. Um, so I couldn't think of a better memory, really, for, mm. for the man himself. Mm. And other than the uh, big wing tour, how else can people get involved and, and support or donate? So like all charities, um, especially in the, in, the, in the times we live in, we're always looking for, for supporters. We're very fortunate in Through the Air Tattoo, we get exposure to um, some big aviation companies. So Boeing sponsor us, uh, the Red Arrows Trust, Lockheed Martin, uh, the pilots of British Airways pay for two scholarships every year. Um, so we're very fortunate to gain this exposure into that side of, of the world, but it, we don't take it for granted. Um, we're always looking for sponsors and for people, not just necessarily financially, but to, to get involved with us as a charity and to spread the word. Um, for those that may be watching or may know somebody who, who this, they could benefit from this, uh, our website is www.fsp, uh, sorry, fsdp.co.uk. Uh, and go online. The applications form is all there. All the details are there. Um, we've done our applications for this year, um, but it, we will be still will be open and we'll be reviewing them next year. Um, and then we take roughly 20 people to RAF Cranwell. So the Air Force come in and support us there. Uh, and again, that's amazing because we go to Cranwell in March for four days and they give us all their officer and air crew selection center. And our doctors come who are all volunteers. Our flying and schools come and they, they come along and they go through selection and aptitude testing and we just get to know them. Um, and right alongside them, you've got the young pilots wanting to join the Air Force. And hmm. right at the start of their career, they are looking across the other side of the room at Cranwell and it's it blows their perceptions as well. And they're talking to each other. It's great to sit back and watch. And that is the magic of this charity. And it's all thanks to people like the Air Force. Um, that we um, have, we're here 40 years later. Mm. That's fantastic. Oh, have we got edit? I've in, not got either on the comments. Is there, is there anything more in there? Uh, it, uh, something connects with a question I had. Um, Brian Wheeler, who we had on as a guest, Brian, obviously uh, one of the trustees of Airability, said, Guy, how do your wheelchair flyers find transferring into the C-42? Do you have to hoist them? And kind of connected to that, you mentioned you've got a whole bunch of flying schools that work with you to provide yeah. training. How are so, they so we them currently we have um three schools uh working with us this year we've got compton abbas um uh, they've got a flying school there they they fly the c42 and obviously with the c42 it it caters to certain areas of disability because of obviously the weight of the aircraft uh the the it's much more accessible than a pa28 um yes they do have a voice down there uh and fiona who runs the school uh has years of experience with our scholars um, and really gets the most out of them at Compton. Uh, we then have uh, PA 28 at Staverton with Bristol Aero Club and then to Weston is our other aero club where they, uh, the flying school there, um, where they have uh, hand controls. Um, but I mean, all of our schools, I cannot say how far they go beyond the, the kind of experience of what would be a normal flying school experience of learning to fly, because they not only what we do with our scholars is it's not just turn up and do your flying lesson. We take them away from their support network, wherever they may live. We take them away from their family that have typically been a real crux in life for them. And our instructors come in, they put their arms around them. They look after them and their buddy because we always pair two scholars together to support each other. Um, they go beyond what you would expect of your standard flying instructor for those three or four weeks in the summer to get the most out of there. And they develop relationships that last for a lifetime with their, with their, with their students. Um, but we've had some pretty funny stories in the past where we've had prosthetic limbs come off doing aerobatics in mid-flight, <laughs> uh, which forced the scholar to redesign his own arm that it would work in, a, in an aircraft. Um, uh, and then we've had those incredible stories as well where um, people have gone the whole way and gone solo 
um, and watching the impact on their family. And all the families come together at the summer at the Royal International Institute, where they're awarded their wings by typically the chief of the air staff and Prince Faisal of Jordan um, in front of their all their support network. And the pride in the and the the kind of also for our sponsors to see the impact of where their money goes is huge. It's massive. And we're very lucky to have the air to two support. And I think my dad would be blown away that we are where we are 40 years later, to be honest. I think I think Douglas Bader would be pretty, pretty impressed. I think he would. Yeah. He would from everything I've been told, and obviously I can't remember him, but I was very fortunate that um uh you know having i lost my uh my mum when i was quite young and he took on a bit of a role there but they handed the baton to a chap called sir dennis crowley milling who was also in reach for the sky the famous film and one of his wingman in the battle of britain and he i was very fortunate to grow up with him as a bit of a godfather and i heard all the stories of what bada was really like and and what a what a man he was and and you can still see that in that whole generation and i think um, the words and, and his actions still ring true today for our scholars. Um, they, they, it's that re refusal to kind of accept a condition or an accident or how you were born or what, what, what has occurred to you in life and to get the most out of it. And it's inspiring for us as trustees and, and flying instructors and the medics. You know, it's a real privilege that these people who are generally when we meet them, at a really low point in their lives, how they um, how they come out of it and the, who they are at the end. Mm. Wow. How do these people? How do the people who come along for selection? Yeah. How do they? How do they put themselves forward, or does someone put them forward? How does that happen? Ah, oh, Dave. I mean, the number of times I've heard a scholar say, "I've written my application form in practice for three or four years in a row." And it took me that long to actually hit the send button um, because it's a really, tr it's a, it's a, it's a very hard process to begin, I think, to take that step away. Um, and like I said, we're not looking for people who are going to be the best pilots. We're not looking forward for people who show the best aptitude to, to do a loop the loop or, or to do the circuits or to do a PFL. What we're looking really is to see who, who is going to get the most impact from the kind of independence that we all know you can get from flight. Um, so they, they, the applications all come in in February. We've just had the ones for this year. It's a really tough job for our doctors, our instructors, our trustees and our, our volunteers. We go through them with a fine tooth comb because we cannot, we don't have the funding or the capacity, if I'm honest, at the moment. We are looking to bring in other flying schools. And any other flying schools watching this that might be interested in supporting the charity or do doing some disabled flying, please do get in touch. Um, but we can only do so many. Um, and the danger as well is if we do more than we can cope with or more scholarships than we cope with, they don't get the same quality of the product and we can't focus the attention. Um, so, and I think that what, that's what defines us from uh, charities like Airability, who do a great job uh, maintaining uh, and keeping a presence of disabled aviation and flying for the disabled, um, they, keep, they keep the ball rolling once our scholars finish. They give them an avenue and an opportunity and a voice uh, alongside ours. Uh, so that's the difference between the two charities. We, we are aimed at people just to show them what they can achieve through aviation, whereas Aerobility is designed to keep them flying and, and keep them within, within this community. Mm. Wow, I've got something in my eye now. No, <laughs> don't because I'm the worst. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, whenever I have to go to an award ceremony or to hand out things, or whenever I meet, whenever we go to Cranwell, Cranwell for us is a real Kleenex moment. We go through them like you wouldn't believe because the incredible thing, and I, I do recruitment for British Airways. In fact, I was doing it today. And um, the interview that we do there, I try not to cry, but the interviews that we do there compared to the interviews at Cranwell, we have these people that come to Cranwell who potentially haven't even shared their anguish with their own family and they sit in front of a group of strangers and just pour everything out. Um, and I don't know if there's some psychological reason that people like to share with strangers more than they would with their own closest kin. Um, but it, it is humbling for us, genuinely humbling. 
and then it, and then that just that gets magnified as they go through their scholarship to the point at at, at the air to where we meet their family who we deliberately keep at arm's length because the idea is we want to know the scholar rather than their family um but we meet their family properly for the first time and then you see the further the wider impact of what you do to the individual how, how it has on all the people around them so it's inspiring it is it's it's a it's a fantastic, and I'm biased, but it, it generally is a fantastic charity, and that's why it's still here 40 years on. Great, thank you. Okay. Well, just picking up, in, <laughs> picking up in the comments, Martin Lusby said, feeling very humble, uh, moving and wonderful, and Alan Patterson says about you, Guy, Guy clearly you're a very genuine, passionate man about this. This is well, very yeah i mean i have been incredibly lucky um you know I, I guess with flying and aviation it was going to be like marmite for me growing up on the air to two and the air to two is a fantastic event and the 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 beating heart of that event is its volunteers and they have been like a family to me growing up and that's what fsdp so i've been in, i've been really lucky and thankfully i like marmite and i like flying so um <laughs> I, I guess I can't even, even once my time as chairman is up, I will still be doing everything I can for both FSDP and the Air to, uh, to keep it going uh, for many more years to come. Very good. I'm Fantastic. Paul Wheel, Paul Wheel says, uh, FSDP, an amazing organization. I feel privileged to have met a scholar and his instructors, truly inspiring. More importantly, Colin Wilkinson said, I found good stuff to buy on the website. Which oh, is great man. Well done, Colin. <laughs> so Good yeah, stuff. you can contribute to uh, to people. Um, you so can. There's one last thing, Ed. Actually, that I'd just like to share with with you guys, and and it's a new thing that uh, that I forgot to mention for our fortieth year. Um, we have created our own little Facebook, and there were there was thought, there was. Caution amongst the trustees if this was going to be a good idea, but it's it's called the Big Wing after Sir Douglas Bader, and it will be launched this year. And the idea is what we want to achieve is to keep to kind of invite the kind of disabled community into one big family online to kind of use it as a support network, a bit like Flyer does here, bringing the aviation community together. Hopefully, it will become a home, an online home for the disabled flying community and those interested in it, where you can share stories of your flying and kind of talk about the airfields you've flown into. So keep your eyes out. It will be an app on your phone called The Big Wing. Um, and hopefully that will, again, help bring kind of get this uh, community uh, a bit more presence in the kind of aviation world. Fantastic. Great. Cool. Look forward to hearing more. <clears throat> Uh, guys, I'll come and talk to you whenever you want. Give us a shout. <laughs> I've just, I've, I've done my best not to say any embarrassing stories because Tim will, Tim Prince will hurt me if I do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Well, Guy, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, oh, pleasure. Do, on it, yeah. What, what, once you get list of airfields together for the tour, do let us know, and we'll keep, we'll keep plugging away at it throughout throughout the year. Thank you. And, and and thanks to everyone that took the time to listen to this. And please do, like I said, uh, spread the word because that's what we want to happen. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Guy. Thank you. Thank Thanks you very much, Guy. <laughs>
Uh, I know yesterday Johnny and Dave were in charge of live stream extra, and I think you rolled out to the viewers again, didn't you, to say, um, "Hey, <laughs> give us a topic for Fantasy Hangar." And I think the viewers selected uh, favourite racing aeroplane, didn't they? Yes, I picked up on the airspeeder story. So uh, okay, yep, fantastic. So um, we're looking for favourite racing aeroplanes. Um, who's first? Right. Oh, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay, you got the Carol's, picture. Carol's keen. We've got a photo. There you go. Uh, now that is obviously the winner. It is the best racing <laughs> aircraft. But I'm going to give the others a chance because I'm cheating because it's fantasy hangar, and there's nothing fantasy about that. It's up and running and alive, and I've worked with it in the hangar, so. It's wrong on the fantasy part, but it is the best one. I mean, let's be honest, it's just drop dead gorgeous. The history of it is that there was a race from Milton Hall to Melbourne to promote um, aviation, you know, travel. And back in 1934, and Sir Geoffrey de Havilland said they're not going to stand by without a British effort. So in nine months, between January and September, he created this creature. And in October, it flew over to Australia. Um, it averaged, uh, was it about 260 miles an hour, or is it not, I remember, along the way, and that includes stops. Um, it won, and it took a few years to get it back, and it, it did all sorts of things along the way, but it eventually came back to Shuttleworth, well, it eventually came back to Hatfield, flew broke, flew broke, got restored and re-restored, and eventually, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's alive and kicking and flying at just, you know, almost every air show at Shuttleworth and it's just breathtaking. So I think, I think, what's, I, 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 I think we could fairly easily stop there because, you know, it's hard, yeah. to, it's hard to beat a comet. What's yeah. amazing <laughs> is potentially in a few, in maybe a year, two years' time maybe, we could maybe throw a little bit more than that. But there's mm -hmm. the potential for three comets to be mm -hmm. airworthy together. Mm -hmm. So, because um, one of the originals is being uh, AC G ACSR is being um, restored to fly, and uh, Ken Fern is building a replica of one of the other ones, mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's really, true. really far advanced. So, there's a good replica at the De Havilland Museum yes. in Hertfordshire. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they've got the green one there, and that's beautiful because it looks real. It looks completely real. But it is a replica so you know go and enjoy that get up close have a good stick yeah, fantastic sky crow we're gonna have to show you the door rotaxes yes do you remember the night that johnny was was the live stream viewers removed johnny from the audience <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. There's a flying replica in the US oh, as well. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm. Well, what's what's in the runners-up positions? What have we got, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> Who's up next? Go on, put Dave. Okay. Go on then, Dave. Right. Well, um, it's funny you should mention about uh, the yeah the way the British were very good at racing aeroplanes, because this aircraft, the Machi MC72 was developed to try and beat the British in the, the Schneider Trophy. Uh, the Brits kind of like winning it every year. And um, uh, the Italians were, yeah, they, they, uh, they, it was under Mussolini at the time, and they really wanted to beat the British. So they threw money at this project. Um, it's designed by a chap called Mario Castoldi, and uh, to, do, to design a specific high-speed aircraft. This is um, it's on they're on floats in those days, and um, it's powered by a Fiat engine, a supercharged V24, generating around 3,000 horsepower, driving contra rotating propellers. Needless to say, it was mechanically unreliable. <laughs> 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 it never got to face the Brits in the Schneider Trophy, and it took a, few, a couple more years before the aircraft finally lived up to expectations when it set a new world speed record which still stands today uh, of 440 miles an hour uh, over Lake Garda. Um, anyway, 
but it looks so beautiful, doesn't it? Nick Allen says, is this one a fancy that no, no, I Nick, Dave actually picked a real live airplane. This one was actually <laughs> made and, and flown. And what's amazing is you you mentioned the V24 engine. Actually, it wasn't a V24. It was two V12s nose to tail. And it was all completely nuts. It was classically, it's, no wonder it was horribly unreliable. And, and all that bronze you could see on the surfaces that was like water it was rate like super thin radiator cooling all over yeah. the airplane i should, so. should just mention the brave pilot who set that record he was the last remaining test pilot of the four <laughs> that set out in the project <laughs> brave guy <laughs> yeah very much so yeah johnny what have you got uh so i've gone for something that it did exist but no longer does and that is oh, no. this. If anyone knows what this is, this is the Napier Heston Racer. Um, it was built in the 40s by the Heston Aircraft Company. Um, and as you can see, it's a beautiful cantilever monoplane. Apparently it has, so it's all, all wood. Um, and there were apparently 20 coats of hand-rubbed lacquer over the over the whole thing um and if it, it, as, as looks go i think it looks fantastic it was powered by the uh, napier saber 24 cylinder um it's in an h configuration is a 2450 horsepower engine it, it looks fantastic it was supposed to be able to reach <laughs> you've stolen a joke from me <laughs> <laughs> I definitely can't do that joke now because it's been used. Um, yeah, 480 miles an hour apparently. That's what it would have would have would have reached. But there were some issues on um, the maiden flight. Um, because... I, one of your issue, I, one of the main issues, I think, Johnny, was that it boiled the pilot, didn't it? <laughs> well, yeah. So it took off and hit a it hit a bump. Um, which launched the airplane into the air and then recovering from the takeoff um, with the gear extended for about uh, about five minutes in the air, um, the engine overheated and that ended up with obviously stuff boiling out all over the place and um, there was a bit of an accident, a bit of, a bit of a crash landing. The guy was fine. It was His name was, I forgot his first name, but Richmond was his surname. Lucky Richmond, probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So he was he was injured, mainly burns, but survived. Um, and they did have a second wow. aircraft in, under under construction, um, but then it all became a bit too much, and they realised it wasn't going anywhere. So they all got. You mean lucky, lucky, Rich, lucky Richmond walked walked into the hangar, set fire to it covertly, and went, "Lads, lads, it's caught fire! Oh no!" <laughs> <laughs> As, as he will go in to put it out with a bucket of petrol. <laughs> <laughs> What's your yeah. choice, Ed? Um, so, uh, I, as Carol picked the Comet, and I would have loved the Comet, and in the past I've picked the Hughes H1, uh, which is a fantastic thing. I went little because I love a little single seater, and I picked the Levere Cosmic Wind, um, of which we are incredibly lucky in the UK because actually we have. The, we have pretty much all the world's population of, of cosmic winds. Uh, there's one under rebuild, one recently imported with Richard Grace at, uh, up at Sywell. And, um, and uh, Pete Kinsey famously has ballerina and has done for a very long time. Um, the cosmic winds were a racer developed by Lockheed's chief engineer, Tony Levere. Uh, and they made three of them. They made, there were some more parts floating around and eventually a, a couple of others got finished. Um, but just a fan, it was built to compete in the um, in the Goodyear Trophy races um, in the Formula One class, and it, I just I've, I've just always loved the Cosmic Wind. I just think it's a sweet little thing, beautiful mm. um, Continental engine. Started with a C eighty five, has an O two hundred, now has an O two hundred, hundred horse. Um, I really wish. Uh, so famously, um, the, the Cosmic Winds were, in, uh, were imported. One was with the Tiger Club. Ballerina was with the Tiger Club and was famously flown by Neil Williams. Um, and that was quite a sight to see. Um, but this just a beautiful little aeroplane. I think I would, I, you know, I'm not sure I'm man enough to fly that. I may just, it's so beautiful and small, I may just stick it up on the wall in my fancy hangar and just gaze at it. <laughs> 
because uh, that is is just magnificent. And um, I really, and I'm kind of hopeful we'll get to see two of these in formation because two of the originals. I Richard's got um, one called Little Tony, um, and uh, obviously Pete's got um, Ballerina. So hopefully we should see those two fly together. So oh, wow. a wonderful little machine. I suspect though none of our choices. Not Johnny's pressure cooker or um, Dave's unreliable Italian <laughs> or my, my tiny little racer. Carol not only wins, she's lapped the other contestants. That's just <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> ah, there we go. That, Pete Pengeli, sympathy vote, Ed wins. <laughs> very, well. um, very nice, Ed. Is that a retractable tail wheel or the result of a big bounce? It's a very tiny tail wheel mounted in the rudder. Um, mm. This is all about lightweight and complexity. Uh, Tony Levere was the first flight test pilot for Starfighter and U2, not Shabby. Uh, and I don't think, I think when Tony and his mates said, hey, we built these little racers to go racing, Lockheed were like, you've done what? We don't want you doing that. So, um, yeah, but um, I, it is fair to say there's a lot of Carol wins. Mm. Um, Thank yeah. you, everybody. Good race choice, Ed, but um, Carol wins. And just a lot of record, uh, yeah. Carol who, wins. Who comes second though? Because Comet's going to win, isn't it? Who, yeah. who comes second? Yeah. Every time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, ba, ba, ba. There was a couple of suggestions. Um, where did I miss it? Uh, Paul Fraser person said, Pond Racer. I picked the Pond Racer once before. That is quite a machine. And someone also suggested the um, a Pod Racer. <laughs> no, a red Baron Mustang. Does anyone? There was a there was a Mustang with a Griffin in it, with contra rotating props, clipped wings. Unbelievable, legendary airplane at Reno in the the late seventies. That was um, early eighties. Quite a machine. But um, okay. yeah, no question, um, the, um, the 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 ponder the um, comet is uh, Carol wins hands down. Thank you, everybody. Can we, can we see Johnny B? <laughs> Why are we whipping Johnny? Is this for the suggestion that we should put Rotexes on them? Um... <laughs> yes. Yeah, Dreadnought Sea Fury. There we go. Yeah, another. Mm. Lots of, there are lots of good races out there. I feel we can revisit this again and again. Do Reno races? Yes. Yeah, Reno, Reno. races. Uh, no one picked a Whitman racer. Yes. That's true. Mm. Yeah, and there were there were a lot of those. So to go around interestingly i get to say now that i fly an airplane where steve whitman also sat in the cockpit because um because my little oh. clip wing cup was on whitman's flying school fleet at oshkosh oh. Oh. that's not a bit of heritage i know wow. <laughs> yeah anyway so events dave and we're overrunning no uh, no no events it's still february so uh well, that's good news then <laughs> <laughs> it's far too cold. Uh, well, in that case, um, uh, so thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, uh, Guy's gone from the green room, but thank you so much, Guy, for joining us and being such a fantastic guest. Obviously, we'll get you more information of the big wing tour of uh, that uh, FSDP does um, in the UK uh, when it becomes available. And um, we'll see everybody uh, next week at th on Thursday at half past seven. So um, right. thanks all and good night. Thank, thank you. you.